Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Milrad. I'm the founder of Movie Karma. We're the nonprofit organization that created our podcast, Rewriting Hollywood, which is focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as representation and social impact in Hollywood. Really looking at the power of storytelling and how it can be harnessed for social change and for social good. Um, today, I'm excited to have uh, a, a group of very special guests who are joining us about their Oscar-nominated uh, film called The Martha Mitchell Effect, uh, which is now streaming on Netflix. It's a fantastic uh, film that I hope folks will check out if you haven't already um, about someone who was once as famous as Jackie O and is, I think, getting some very well-deserved renewed attention. It's an archival uh, documentary portrait of Martha Mitchell, really the unlikeliest of whistleblowers, a Republican cabinet wife who was gaslighted by the Nixon administration to keep her quiet. And it really offers uh, us as, as modern day viewers, a, a, a female gaze on Watergate um, through the voice of the woman herself, Martha Mitchell. I'm joined today by a, a slew of now Oscar nominated um, talented folks behind this project. We have Anne Alvergi, uh, Deborah McClutchy, who are the directors of the, of the project. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. And then you're welcome. And then uh, we have producers as well, uh, Beth Levison and Judith Mizrahi. Um, Judith and Beth, welcome as well. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. And we're, we have a lot to cover and, and, um, and a lot of questions to get through. Um, each of you have some really esteemed backgrounds. I guess I'll start a little bit with, um, with our producers here, Beth and Judith. Uh, Beth, you're an award-winning uh, New York City-based producer. You've had some incredible credits um, that have screened at Tribeca, AFI Docs, among other places. Um, you also produced and directed the Peabody-nominated uh, Storm Lake and co-founded the Documentary Producers Alliance. Judith, you are also have, have a pretty robust background here. Your projects have screened at Sundance, New York Film Festival, South by Southwest, among elsewhere. Um, and your most recent film, The Bookseller, as I understand, premiered a few years ago and has, has been released around the world. So for the two of you, tell us a little bit, if you would, just about your backgrounds beyond what I just shared and what interested you in this project initially. Maybe, uh, Beth, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, for me, I have a real interest in stories about women. I feel like stories about women are often or haven't been told, and I had never um, heard this particular story before. So I think I was really intrigued by that. And I also, to be honest, I really focused a lot on verite filmmaking. And I just was really excited about the prospect of this approach to this particular film that Anne and Deborah wanted to take. So I think it was really the subject matter that aligned with my interests and the opportunity to sort of do something a little different during COVID um, when, you know, I don't know, I think we were all looking for something to hang on to. Uh, that was a really exciting prospect for me. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. We're all looking for for something to, to I guess, believe in again and, and stories to tell. Um, and then same question to you, Judith, what, what um, tell us a little bit about your background, types of projects you're drawn to, and what about this particular project that drew you to it? Yeah, so before um, producing full time, I, I worked in distribution. I worked um, for an organization called Women Make Movies. So I very focused on women filmmakers telling women's stories. Um, so when I heard about the project from, from Deborah and Ann, I immediately thought it was a fantastic story and that, that Martha was a fantastic subject. Um, not only, you know, she so charismatic and brave and she spoke out, but she was also, I kind of love that she was flawed um, and a complicated person. And I think that makes her just interesting and human. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was, yeah. And, and everything Beth said as well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, definitely a complicated character and a, and a really complicated, I would say nuanced portrait you've given of us, of her life here. Um, I guess my question to you, Anne, and, and, and then Deborah, um, Anne, for you, what attracted you to, to this project? I mean, I know you're, you're yourself an award-winning documentary filmmaker. You've done a variety of different types of documentaries, including the story of, of Roy Cohn, obviously a very, <laughs> you know, quite a character there. Um, and, and your films have screened worldwide. Um, 
what about this project intrigued you? And also to add to that, why did you feel like now was a good time to, to tell this particular story? Yeah. Um, well, I would say I edited those films just to, okay. just to okay. clarify. clarify, but yes, yes, sure you, you, you feel like you, okay. you kind of own yeah. them or invest in them. Yeah. Edit, yeah. Editors, ma editors need more attention. Yeah. So let's give you that. Yeah, yeah. You. I appreciate <laughs> that. But yeah, I mean, it was part of that. You know, I've worked on a number of, um, you know, archival based biographies. And so I sort of know that genre well. And I'd always wanted to tell that story, but in an all archival fashion or, you know, as much as you can. And when I heard about Martha, you know, I couldn't believe that A, we didn't know about her and B, that there hadn't been a documentary about her. And the more that Deborah and I dug into the footage, the more we realized that there was something there that she was incredibly popular with the press. Um, and that we knew there was a lot of footage. We knew there'd be a lot of footage. We already knew there was verite home movies of the Nixon administration, so we could tell that side. So it was really just a, a sort of an, you know, really an archival journey to find the rest of it and see how much we can sort of tell. And then we also learned about the gaslighting, you know, campaign against her by digging into the White House tapes. So it was, it was kind of kind of all of that, I would say. Yeah, that's there's a oh. lot there, and, and great. I uh, know I was going to go to you, Deborah, uh, to build on that of just um, again your background. You, you've been an independent filmmaker, of course, as well, and have had some incredible um, success there. I understand also in the um, as a senior creative staff member um, at an independent film distribution company. So you've also had a lot of experience with different types of stories and projects. Oh, what interested you? And I guess to add to in, in this specifically, but to add to what Anne was saying. Um, you know, what about Martha's story particularly was um, felt very like kind of calling your name to say, okay, we need to tell this story now in this way. Yeah, so my background is um, production as well as distribution. I was a, a distribution company for about 11 years before I pivoted to making films again. Um, and it's been pretty exciting. Um, and so Martha as a character just really drew me. Um, she's charismatic, telegenic, really smart, really funny. And then her story really resonated for our, the political climate that we've all been living in for you know the past several years, especially with the previous administration. I would argue that our entire country was gaslighted by that administration, mm -hmm. not only women, although women are often the primary victims of gaslighting, uh, but it happens to men as well. So our, our film was really a case study in that, and Martha's story was really a case study in that, which really drew me to her story as well. And I felt like it was relevant today, sadly, as much as it was important back then. Yeah, certainly relevant, and I'm you know fully agree that we've been through um, certainly <laughs> certainly some of those. Uh, some similarities between what we've been going through the last few years and 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 what happened um, back in the '70s. I was going to ask um, to to go back to our producers, um, Beth and Judith, around if you could just share for our listeners, you know, for folks who haven't seen the film yet, and I encourage folks to or haven't read much on Martha or seen much on her yet. Um, can you give us a sense of who she was and and why do you feel like in particular her her life? you know, A, mattered, but B, to what um, I think Deborah was saying, you know, was kind of buried and 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 maybe uh, you could argue kind of twisted by history. Like we really didn't, we really don't know much about her. A lot of us don't at least. Um, maybe I'll give that to, to Beth. Oh, I was going to pass it to Julie. <laughs> or either one of you. <laughs> you want to um, go? Or? Well, I'll, I'll just say, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it, the campaign against her was fairly effective when you talk to people now um you know either people don't know who she was or they have like kind of a vague sense or like you know, wasn't she like crazy alcoholic and then you know that's all they remember occasionally you do speak usually to a woman who who you know was around that time who's like oh my god i love martha i love that she spoke out but a lot of you know times she, she really was um kind of erased um to a lot of people so um it's just really important she was but at the time she was i mean she was out there all the time and she's incredibly charismatic so um i think it's just important that we all like see what happened understand that women's stories are sometimes forgotten and it's you know as, as filmmakers it's super important for us to to um bring her story back um and as we were saying it's really important now that um 
you know, that young women are, can see why, you know, how gaslighting works, what are the mechanisms of it. And once they know that they can recognize it and hopefully stop it. Um, and I'll just add about that, you know, we've gotten so much feedback from women who tell me they watched it with their daughters, their like 12 year olds or their teenage daughters. And, um, and so, yeah, it's great to hear that, that people are, that her story is getting out there to young women. Mm, that's really fascinating. I want to dive into certainly all of that in terms of how both women and men and others are receiving this um, and what it means for us today. Um, I guess, Beth, if you wanted to add to that or, you know, yeah. open the floor, go ahead. I mean, I think while making the film, one thing that was really just so interesting is she was a woman in the 1960s, you know, early 70s. She was both a product of those times, but also sort of outside of them. I'm always torn if she was ahead of her time or if we've just been chronically behind the times. <laughs> um, and she was a Southerner and she sort of found herself in Washington, uh, you know, alongside her husband. She was outspoken really at a time when political wives were not expected to say much at all. Um, I love how John Mitchell describes her himself as the unguided missile. Um, and she was unbelievably smart and clever and had such a capacity for the English language and uh, was really able to express herself. And so she was just this very larger than uh, life character. And I, I think that there was, she was seen as a threat. She was convenient to the administration until she was seen as a threat. And I think that we've seen this before. And that was the moment at which sort of her fortune changed and that she was really erased uh, from the record. And when I thought about Watergate before this film, I thought about all the president's men. And so, you know, to really uh, have this opportunity to show that there was a woman who blew the whistle so early on, it's, it's really, um, it's just a fascinating uh, moment in history that we've been able to extract. Yeah, it's truly fascinating and truly, um, you know, it's an, it's fortunate that we get to see your film and and hear her story now. It's also, of course, unfortunate we, we, it's been so long to to not sort of give her her due. Um, I wanted to get to Anne and, and Deborah on, the, on those points. Um, she was the, as you alluded to, um, Beth, the, the wife of John Mitchell, who was the attorney general for the president for Nixon and also ran his campaign. I mean, she was very intimately, of course, involved in the machinations of the Nixon administration, sounds like from the really the earliest days and was, a, as you said, I mean, a, a real, it seemed like an asset to them, but they always knew that she could perhaps go go a different direction. Um, I guess for, in terms of framing the film, Anne and Deborah are, are you know, thinking about how to direct this pro project. Um, what was your approach to telling this story? Because obviously there's so many ways you could, we could maybe slice and dice the record or give a portrait of her that could be slanted in one way or the other. How did you all approach this and think about that? Um, maybe, Anne, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we always, we knew we wanted to make an archival film and it was really important in order to restore agency to Martha to prioritize her voice as much as possible. So we we wanted her to drive the narrative. And so that was sort of the always the goal, right? I mean, we couldn't just rely upon her voice though, because she wasn't always talking about everything we needed. And so we also, you know, interviewed contemporary uh, primary sources, players from that era left in an audio, and also leaned on the news, the um, the newsmen, right? as sort of proxy for like sort of establishing the macro story and also to sort of see how gendered their approach was in describing Martha and how they were also complicit in the campaign. Um, you know, I, I would say, so I would say the audio was the driving force as, you know, as is the telephone. That was like a trope throughout. She was very much attached to the telephone. That was her means. That was her Twitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's how she communicated with, mm -hmm. with everyone. And so we sort of tried to, you know, sprinkle that kind of throughout. Yeah, it's yeah, very I well done. Answer that. We, from the get-go, when we first started researching the story, we kind of framed it in um, a love triangle, which people have found Kind of amusing but it really was nixon and um martha were vying for john mitchell's attention 
and they were incredibly jealous of each other in that way. So it really is sort of a, a love triangle in that sense. And it also kind of gets at the personal nature of her story. You know, we wanted to tell this macro story about the political machinations and the gaslighting that happened to her, but there was a tragic love story that happened. And towards the end of the film, John Mitchell says, you know, it could have been a lot worse. I could have been sentenced to live with Martha Mitchell. And so in that sense, it's just like a very human, tragic story, um, which really allowed us to feel even more compassion for Martha's character and more empathy for her. Yeah, it really is. I mean, tragic and also, I mean, it's like her character essentially is revealed in a lot of ways through the decisions she makes and sort of how she deals with what unfolds. Um, I guess, Beth, Judith, if you wanted to add to you, that pivotal moment, because I think a lot of folks don't, maybe, you know, I know I certainly didn't before um, your film came out and some other projects about her life, but this pivotal moment in her life where she's faced with, I mean, she really becomes a whistleblower in Watergate and how, and, and sort of, I would say shifts kind of to this character of saying, even to your point, Deborah, of going against her husband. Um, and I think at one point is quoted, um, as saying, you know, you know, get the bastard essentially, like he should be held accountable for for her husband should be held accountable for his part in in the scandal. Um, so I guess Beth Judas, could you talk a little bit more about how you presented or thought about that pivotal moment in her in her life and and how you wanted to present that that part of her journey? I think um I mean, I think it's fascinating to that we see that we see in the footage. I mean, you can actually see it in her eyes. Um, you know, she starts when the film starts. She's kind of towing the party line. She's she may not be the most standard political wife. She's you know she's different. She's outspoken, but she's still kind of you know she's doing what she's supposed to do. Um, and then you kind of see like her eyes being opened, and she learns what happened to her. How she was you know they tried to silence her. Um, and how her husband was part of it and, you know, who, you know, by all accounts, she was incredibly in love with. So it was, it's kind of heartbreaking, but it is, you know, it, it's, it's great that we can even see it because she was such a public figure and always, you know, did so many interviews, we can, you can really see this awareness happening and the change that happens from the beginning to the end of the film and, and her life too, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and speaking. Go ahead. Ooh, and just speaking to what Deb was saying, I mean, it's such an exploration of power, right? I mean, they were to see sort of the, where she, how far she fell and the power that the administration retained through it all and how successfully they gaslighted her that she went from, you know, the White House essentially to the pink house to working in a dress shop and, and really died um, destitute, destitute and alone. So it's tragic and a reflection of political power and largely male political power, if not entirely male political power. And that's something that we've been witness to today. So 50 years later, um, you know, 2022 was the 50th anniversary of Watergate. So. 50 years later, it's a very current story. It's not an archival story. It's a story that's as relevant today um, as any other. Yeah, it's such a great point. And it is so deeply relevant. Um, I wonder on that point, uh, perhaps Deborah, if you could comment on the relevance of this project and and what you've been hearing from folks who've been who've been watching it, um, because you know it certainly connects very directly to what women experience to this day in the halls of power, but also more broadly in society and how and how particularly women, but others, others who are historically marginalized are, you know, experienced in these types of situations. Yeah, well, uh, gaslighting was the Merriam-Webster's word of the year, right? So there's an awareness of gaslighting that is happening today um, that there wasn't an awareness in Martha's day. So that's incredibly important. And if our film can shed some light on that and show people, you know, the mechanisms as to how those um, gasoline campaigns happen, then they can fight against it, which I think Judith had mentioned earlier on. But, you know, there's abuse of power that happens today. There's a severe threat to democracy that we haven't seen since Watergate. 
Um, so the relevancy of Martha's story just really resonates with what's continuing to go on in our country. Um, so if people see her story and think, oh, this sounds familiar, um, it's because it really is. So, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I ending with that no no that's right i mean it's it's spot on i think it's deeply relevant in all the ways you pointed out um i, I guess and i mean building on that point it you know i i just wonder if you could comment on we saw obviously that with with nancy pelosi's tenure i mean breaking all kinds of barriers for women in power among other women that we've seen in in the halls of congress and uh you know in the White House adjacent now, of course, the vice president, but, um, you know, making some progress, you could argue in terms of women holding leadership roles and sort of having that agency in, in the political sphere. But also we see attacks on folks like Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and, and, and other women, particularly women of color. Um, what is your sense on kind of the trajectory of women in power since Martha's, Martha's time? Are we on a trend line in a positive direction, or do you feel like we are kind of in fits and starts there? I mean, I think I think women have made great great strides, right, in the last fifty years. There's no doubt about that. There's more women in power, and that alone speaks volumes. However, the same playbook is still at play with the patriarchy. I mean, it's you know you discredit your enemies so they can be dismissed and not taken seriously. And it's people who are fearful, right? People in power who are, who are fearful. I mean, you see it with, with Trump now. He's dismissing Nikki Haley as his opponent. He's saying she's overly ambitious. That's her problem. I mean, it's the same, it's the same stuff. So, you know, I feel like there's been progress, but there will always be people who are going to try to backpedal and backlash and, and um, bring people down. But the difference is that now we are more cognizant of the mechanisms. We can call it for what it is. And we still, I just want to add to that, and we still mm -hmm. have not been able to elect a female president when there are other female leaders all across the world right. um, who have been incredibly effective, and yet America is so far behind in that sense. Definitely. Yeah, it really are. Yeah, and did you want to add to that again? More? Oh, I just said definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my yeah. ad. <laughs> Amen. I mean, Judith, I guess I'll go to you. Like, what do you think Martha Mitchell would say about? that you know that at least that that part of it obviously not having elected a female president 50 some years later and obviously seeing what hillary clinton and others have gone through to try to break that barrier um but also the way that women are still treated in power today in politics today i just wonder if me judith or beth you could comment on how martha might react to how how far we've come or, or maybe how far we've not come beth you want to take that <laughs> Such a tricky question, because in some ways she was a product of her time, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that she, um, you know, she was John Mitchell's wife. And when that fell apart, she, that she sort of, her life fell apart. So um, it, it's, it's hard to say. I, I think that she wanted the best for her country. And so I think I could imagine that she might have been progressive enough to think that more women in power would be good for the would be good for the country and would be good for our democracy. But it's hard to time travel her to 2023. Right. <laughs> At least it is for me, Judith. I don't know if you have a thought. <laughs> I think she'd be happy. I think you can, you know, when you watch some interviews with her, she, she again, like may be saying what she thinks she's supposed to say, but I feel like you can see that she, um, you know, and she would never call herself a feminist. I don't think, you know, in her time and who she was, but I, I think she had those inclinations. So I think she'd be happy. I think she had a, a really strong moral compass. And I think she would be super psyched to see women calling men of power out. Yeah. Yeah. Deborah, do you want to add to that? <laughs> in her day, she actually did advocate for more women in politics and a woman on the Supreme Court. She spoke mm -hmm. to her husband and spoke to Nixon about that and was a big advocate of that. So, um, yeah. So I think she would be very pleased with the power that women have achieved and yet very dismayed that we haven't come as far as we should have by now. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. And I know it's a tricky question, but that's interesting that she obviously commented on some of the things that are still relevant today. Um, 
I guess one of my last questions would just be what lessons we feel like you, or you all feel like we could draw from Martha's life. Um, I, mean, I think in particular from her, um, yeah, I mean, as some of you have mentioned kind of her self, having enough self-awareness and courage to basically say like the water that I'm swimming in is not, is not good water essentially, or the people around me, including my husband are not doing ethical things, which I think is maybe one of the hardest things that any of us could, could, I would argue could possibly do. So what lessons, if any, you feel like we could draw from, from Martha now beyond what you've shared? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Judith. Um, I, I guess just generally, I mean, I hope, I hope she inspires people to just be brave and keep speaking out. You know, we obviously see how hard it is all the time and there can, there can be consequences, but um, it, it can also affect real change. So I, yeah, I think I just, hope the film inspires people and, her, and she inspires people to to keep speaking out when they see injustice yeah that. um let's go to you uh deborah you want to add to that yeah what's that saying absolute power corrupts and power corrupts absolutely um so i'll just back up judith as long as we can hold those who are in power to account then um we're all responsible for that, you know, in a democracy, we're all responsible for being good citizens of a democracy and carrying that forward. And so as much as we can call out abuses of power, um, then we should despite the consequences, because what we risk is, is losing the very fragile democracy that we're hanging on to right now. Hmm. Yeah, beautifully said. Um... And if you wanted to add to that and, um, you know, and yeah. to maybe a, a sub question, is it harder, is it harder to call out or easier or, or you know, is, because of the fragmentation of media, because of some of the other changes we've seen, is it, it what are your thoughts on whether, you know, a Martha Mitchell would have a harder time um, or doing, doing, calling out power in that way? Hmm. I mean, I, I, I will sort of echo what, what she just said. I think that, I hope that she's an inspiration. I mean, look look at where we are today. There aren't a lot of Republican women that are crossing party lines to speak truth to power. We don't see Karen Pence doing this, right? She's not testifying or volunteering to testify in January 6th. So I think that Martha was, was quite unique and was absolutely a pioneer. Um, you know, whether it's it's tougher today, I mean, that's a hard question to say because in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. I mean, there's a lot more, even though we can recognize what gaslighting is and call it what it is, there's so many trolls. There's so many like means to, to sort of demonize women on multiple levels. So I, I'm not sure I can answer that. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, Beth, what are your thoughts on um, the legacy or lessons we can draw from Martha? Well, I guess I'll just say that one thing that we haven't really talked about that I think about a lot when I think about this film is the power of the press and the role of the press in supporting our democracy. And we, um, and so I think that, I guess I just think about that a lot. And today we have, we do have Twitter, we do have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have all the other ways that we can uh, attack and dismantle actually our democracy. So I guess I would just say that um, the systems are still in place um, that were in place then. And she was incredibly strong. She was incredibly brave. She was against huge forces, a political machine, um, a press that sort of did what the president wanted in some ways. And I guess I would just say those are still in place today. And we're seeing this play out, not just in politics, but in, in so many other fields. So we have evolved but the systems are still in place and ready to be dismantled. And we need to look at all of those systems um, if things are going to change for, for, for women who do speak out. Yeah, I love that. And I guess it goes right into my closing question, which just is that one of the systems at play here is obviously Hollywood. Um, and <laughs> it's long, um, often uh, not not so friendly uh, history, obviously, in terms of treatment towards women and women filmmakers, women creators, and others. 
I just wonder if any of you or all of you want to comment on on that trend line or trajectory in terms of inclusion and equity for women in particular in Hollywood and having more um, you know women focused stories and female centric storytellers um, at the helm to tell these types of stories because as you said we hadn't you know one could argue we haven't seen the story in part because of that dynamic um, being told um, so I don't know if Judith do you have thoughts on that um, yeah, I mean, I think things have, have gotten a lot better. So that's, I mean, that's the good news. There's, there are a lot more, um, especially in the field of documentary, um, less so certainly in narrative and fiction, but there are a lot of women telling stories about women and, um, you know, and the change is, is there, there should be more women filmmakers, but also, system, you know, systemic change, there have to be um, gatekeepers, you know, that are also uh willing to share women's stories and i think things have um certainly gotten better i think our experience we we worked with so many fantastic um women um and men but who really 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 supported this story so um and and hopefully there'll be a lot more uh women entering the filmmaking field and telling stories like this yeah i hope so I, um, go I, ahead I, I, I would just add that, you know, I feel like, and this, I feel like this happens in fiction and documentary, but I agree with you that it happens more in documentary, but I feel like there's a recognition of telling stories of flawed, complicated women. I feel like 10 years ago, that was not allowed. People weren't, people were interested, but the powers that be were not interested in telling those stories. And I feel like there's a lot more latitude to do that. And, and for audiences to be hungry for that kind of story. Yeah, absolutely. But Beth, did do you agree with that? Or I don't answer that. I agree with everything that's just been said so far. I mean, one thing I'm really proud of this team. We are an all-female team. We brought our experience and our lens to the project, um, but really worked very hard to tell the complexities of Martha's story as best we could. And um, and the other thing that you know, a creative choice that we made in the beginning, it was going to be a feature. And, but we realized that we could really tell Martha's story and we wouldn't have to get into all the political machinations and Nixon and Watergate and repeat some of that. We could really tell that story through a short. So um, I think, you know, this has been, I'm, I'm like, I, this has been an amazing experience. I'm really proud of the team and, I just hope that, uh, you know, it opens the doors for more women to tell their stories and that we keep on breaking them down. We're 50% of the population. We have lots to say. Absolutely. At least 50. Yeah. <laughs> um, Deborah, I mean, I'll give you the pressure of the last word if you like. Uh, what, what... She's good at that. Okay, good. Um, leave us maybe on a, if you can, on a hopeful note of, uh, if you wanted to add anything, but you know, what it, what is your hope for the future of, of filmmaking and storytelling in this in this way, and with hopefully this type of agency for particularly women filmmakers? Yeah, coming from uh, the distribution world, it's interesting because um, it's it's a real pleasure to be in documentary and be within a community that really does support a lot of female storytellers um, and female producers, female directors. There's really great representation and really talented women who are in this community. In the narrative and fiction filmmaking world, it's much harder for women and there are fewer, unfortunately. So I hope things get better in that world. Um, so yeah, there's some work to be done for sure, but there are strides that have been made. And um, yeah, I'm very psyched to be in the documentary community with all of these kick-ass women, if I can say that. You can, <laughs> yes, podcast, I can say kick-ass. Yeah. <laughs> Totally like a real pleasure <laughs> being an all-female team and primarily a female team. We did have, you know, a graphics person who was a man and a composer who was a man, but they were absolutely fantastic as well. <laughs> <They're good. laughs> and, really good ones. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> just to add, our executive producers are women, our creative leads at, at Netflix are women. Yeah. So, yeah, so really community. was an amazing experience. Well, Reflective I, of perhaps the change that we are a part of. 
love that yeah be- beautifully said and i hope you know uh, hope martha will be proud i hope i hope everyone uh listening and watching is is proud to hear that i know i am so hopefully a sign of, of good things to come um again our guests today and deborah directors of the film and then beth and judith producers the film is the martha mitchell effect you can watch it right now on netflix you definitely should if you haven't already is oscar nominated for the upcoming 2023 academy awards and congrats to you both and to all of you all four of you and then um also thank you so much for joining us this is really an amazing uh, honor to have you all on thank you so much, so much. Yeah. This was great. great thanks for having us jared you're welcome